We're on. We're on. <laughs> Wake it up. What a good audience. Oh, my God, you're good. You're jammed in here. And you want to hear about LBJ. And I've been doing LBJ for 30 years. And this is Mark Updegrove, who has written the best book about LBJ that I have ever read. And I have read them all, including all but the last Cairo episode. I want to read you something, and then we're going to get going. It's a short read. This is the beginning of something that should have happened better, could have happened better, and will happen in the future if we can get it going. This is LBJ. What year was it? Uh, Ann Arbor? Uh, 1965. 1965. For a century, we labored to settle and to subdue a continent. For half a century, we called upon unbounded invention and untiring industry to create an order of plenty for all of our people. The challenge of the next half century is whether we have the wisdom to use that wealth to enrich and elevate our national life and to advance the quality of our American civilization. Your imagination, your initiative, and your indignation will determine whether we build a society where progress is the servant of our needs or a society where old values and new visions are buried under unbridled growth. For in your time, we have the opportunity to move not only toward the rich society and the powerful society, but upward to the great society. That's Lyndon Johnson, not the other stuff you heard about. Mark, Mark, I want to ask you this. Your, this book is a positive reevaluation of a president who is consistently denigrated and dissed, who is the subject of undying conspiracy theories based on his own words and others and his dreams and his policies. How did you come to make the want to make this book? Well, first of all, uh, thank you all for coming. I, what, it, what an honor it is to be here, and what an honor it is to be interviewed by Larry. Larry did a, a one-man show of LBJ, which was wildly popular. And if you saw that show and saw Larry's performance, you would think you were looking at Lyndon Johnson himself. So Big makeup. Uh, I've, uh, <laughs> I've known it's about Larry for years. I've seen that performance on tape, but we've never met until now. So this is a, a double pleasure to talk to you all and to be moderated by my new friend, Larry. Uh, so thank you so much for yes, being sir. here and doing this. Uh, you know, I, Lyndon Johnson is, I'm a presidential historian, and Lyndon Johnson is a vastly underappreciated American president. Yeah. He has never, true uh, until recently, he had never been given his due. Um, I'll tell you a quick story. There are so many wonderful stories about LBJ, but LBJ was a master of getting things done. And, um, and he knew uh, how to get people to bend to his will, hence the title of my book, Indomitable Will. And you can see him applying his unique <laughs> brand of influence with Richard Russell, senator from Georgia, in this picture. Uh, Hubert Humphrey said he used to get so close, I would insist that he either propose or get on with it, you know. <laughs> um, but, but Lyndon Johnson, one of the things he knew is that if you wanted to get, uh, do something nice for somebody, you do something nice for their kids. And so in that spirit, right before a legislative session uh, in Congress, <coughs> he invited all of uh, the, the senators and representatives with their families to a carnival on South Lawn. And uh, it fell to Bess Abel, the social secretary, who Larry knows, to organize that carnival. So she got the ponies for the pony ride. She got the, the Ferris wheel. And one of the many things she had to do was call a crystal ball manufacturer in Pennsylvania to get the crystal balls for the fortune teller's tent. So she calls this gentleman in, 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 in Pennsylvania, and she tells him what she wants. She describes exactly the balls that she wants. And the gentleman says, well, I'd be happy to, 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 to send those to you. Where should I send them? And she says, the White House. And there's a pregnant pause on the other end of the line. And he finally says, the president knows these don't work, right? <laughs> if Lyndon Johnson had that crystal ball, Larry knows this, the one thing he would want to know is, what is my place in history? And for so long, Lyndon Johnson's place in history was defined by what? 
Vietnam. Be, and that, that war so divided this country yeah. that it took a long time for that dark cloud of Vietnam to dissipate. And for us to see the transformational and seminal laws of the great society, which effectively provide the foundation for modern America. And so I, I, what I wanted to do, what I was intent in doing, not only in writing this book, but becoming the director of the LBJ Presidential Library, which uh, a position I held for eight years, was to see th Lyndon Johnson achieve his rightful place in history, to get credit, the due credit for those transformational laws that make us who we are today. And I think that if Lyndon Johnson were to cast his eyes in that crystal ball and it actually worked, he would be very pleased with the ways being evaluated among historians today. It takes about 20 years for people to start to reevaluate a president, it seems to me. That's exactly right. It takes at least a generation for passions yeah. to cool around any president. Yeah. But for Lyndon Johnson, it was that much greater. For because there, there were so many complications around his administration, but in particular, it was that dark shadow of Vietnam. I, my, my story, if you ask me for a story yeah, about, please. about Lyndon, uh, it's not so much about Lyndon, but uh, on the 25th anniversary of the inauguration, I was asked by Lady Bird to do my show, 40, 45 minutes of my show at the, uh, uh, the Mayflower Hotel in Washington, D.C. And the cabinet was present, and Lady Bird was present, and Linda and Lucy and all of those people. I was shaking in my boots, and I came out, I came out swinging. And uh, afterwards, uh, I ended with something that I didn't know Lyndon had, had done, but uh, he was very fond of America the Beautiful. And he ended with, with a verse from that. And I just chose that and ended with a verse. And Lady Bird got up, and it was the end of my show, and I had one more thing to say about getting elected. And I was heading down the stairs, and Lady Bird rose from her chair, and she came to me. And she came to me like this, as she always did because that was Lady Bird, to hug me. And I stiff-armed her, because I had another line to give. <laughs> <laughs> and i never forget that. And afterwards, <laughs> I, uh, some people were coming around, and one was the wife of a Secret Service agent. And, uh, and she said, you know, uh, uh, my husband loved it when you were playing pocket pool. And all you guys may understand what that means, unless you're too young. Pocket pool is when you put your hand in your pocket and you play with your balls. <laughs> and and, and, and I said, uh, you, 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 you remember that? She said, yes, the problem is you didn't do it quite enough. <laughs> you know, we're talking about Lyndon Johnson, so it was bound to get earthy. <laughs> That's right. Well, <laughs> I, I, I'd say, if I may, a quick, there are so many great stories of Lyndon Johnson. We'll talk about some substantive stuff, but one of my favorite stories is um, LBJ, when he was senator, he was probably the most powerful Senate majority leader we've had in our history. He just had an instinctive knowledge about how to get things done and knew the legislative process yeah. probably better than anybody of the 20th century. Or, uh, or so far. Or so far, right, exactly. Uh, and it's, uh, uh, he was going back to Texas to, to run for re-election, and he, he convened his speechwriters in his office uh, so that they could uh, review a, a stump speech that they had crafted for him. And he starts reading the speech, and he, he comes across this, packet, uh, this, this passage from... Socrates, a quote from Socrates, and he says, Socrates, Socrates, let me get this straight. I'm going back to Texas to talk to, talk to just plain folks, and you have me quoting Socrates? He said, keep the quote, but start it with, my daddy always used to say. <laughs> uh, he loved his daddy. Let me ask you that daddy. now that you brought his daddy and, and his, his mother into it by, uh, by association. Where did he get his innate sense of social justice, which he had? Hard to know, uh, Larry. I, um, I think he grew up in a small town where, uh, as he said, uh, uh, people know when you're sick and care when you die. Yeah. Uh, and, and you have a certain social responsibility in that town to take care of your neighbor. He saw the best and the worst of people uh, in small town Texas in so many respects. But I think that the, the, his sense of, of social justice really comes from a formative experience in his life in Catula, Texas. Between his junior and senior years in college, when he needed money to finish college, he takes a job as a principal at a Mexican-American school in Catula, Texas, which is really in nowhere, Texas. And he's teaching these Mexican-American school kids. Yeah. And he sees through their eyes bigotry and poverty 
and the hatred inflicted on them. And he resolves to do something about it. He tries to build these kids up as much as he can. He even tells uh, some of the young men that they could grow up to be president, which is an audacious notion for a young Mexican-American kid in Central Texas at that time. But when he goes to Washington, um, he remembers those kids. And when he becomes president, he'll bark out to members of his staff, remember those kids in Catula. This is for them. Uh, when he gives his most famous speech, which, which Larry does brilliantly in his portrayal of Lyndon Johnson, which is ap his appeal for voting rights, he invokes those kids. And he said, I never thought in 1927 yes. that I would have the power to help those kids and those like them in our nation. But now I have that power. And I'll let you in on a little secret. I, I mean to use, to it. use it. And yeah. use it he did. That's exactly how he used his, his political power, to, to, to help people like those Mexican-American school kids. That, that, that speech, of course, comes right after uh, what we now know as Bloody Sunday, which is the march uh, for voting rights right. from Selma to Montgomery, that thwarted march, that, that brutal scene that played out with Alabama state troopers uh, literally beating those marchers down. And, and Lyndon Johnson used that, the moral imperative of that moment to implore reluctant lawmakers to pass the Voting Rights Act. Interesting thing about Lyndon, I would say, was when he said those things, we hear politicians talk that way all the time. You know, I remember those kids. And, but he meant it because he never forgot it. And he carried on with it. And he carried on with it right through civil rights and all the way through his life. And his very last act, uh, when he disobeyed the doctor's orders and almost killed himself going to, to, uh, to uh, Austin, to a civil rights symposium. If we ever have time, we'll tell that story, but probably won't. But I, because I want to ask you about, uh, uh, well, I'm, I'm not going to talk about indomitable will yet. Let's talk about Lady Bird, can mm. we? Mm. Talk about innate sense of justice and Lady Bird and, and the love affair between those two, which was real. You know, they, 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 they were a perfect complement in many respects. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. She smoothed his rough edges, <laughs> um, and she taught him patience as much as she could. And I think, and she, he was very rough on her in many respects. He, he, I think, without question, Lady Bird Johnson was the true love of Lyndon Johnson's life. He wasn't exactly a faithful husband. He was a loyal husband in a lot of ways. But, but he truly loved her, and he relied on her. And she, as she put it, made him more than I would have been. He pushed her out on stage. She was naturally diffident, very shy. But he pushed her out there. And she was, she, she was, I think, amazed herself in what she could achieve by having this husband who had so much faith in her put her in the spotlight. We have beautiful highways as a result of Lady Bird Johnson. The modern environmental movement, if not catalyzed, or if, or if not created, was catalyzed by Lady Bird Johnson by focusing on the environment. There's a great... Uh, I have a couple of tapes that I'd be delighted to play for you, but the crown jewels of the LBJ Presidential Library are uh, the, the taped telephone conversations of LBJ doing the business of his presidency. And if you hear those tapes, you hear a man who is so passionate about what he's doing as president, so engaged, so knowledgeable about what he's doing. But one of the great tapes is, is of uh, a conversation that he has with Lady Bird on after what was his second uh, uh, press conference. And he's, he, he gives it outside of the White House, and he's getting in the car, and he calls uh, Lady Bird, and she says, I, I, I've got some notes. Do you want to hear them now? Should I wait till later? He says, no, 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 ma'am. Give them to me now. And she goes through this, this very detailed criticism. Yes. And at the very end, she says, I'd give it a B plus. <laughs> and I, it's funny because uh, Barack Obama, Barack and Michelle Obama were at, at the LBJ library around the, the Civil Rights Summit that we had in, uh, in 2014. Uh, and uh, Michelle Obama was listening to that, that conversation on a handset that we have in the, the exhibit. And uh, Barack Obama was listening to conversations on another handset. And she's listening to this conversation. She says, oh, Barack's got to hear this. <laughs> so she goes over to him. <laughs> she gets him off his handset. He walks over. He picks up her handset. He pushes the button. He listens to that conversation, gets to the part where she says, I'd give it a B plus, and looks at me, and he says, some things never change. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
uh, my, I met Lady, Lady Bird early on in doing the play. And finally, after a long period of time of doing the play and her seeing it each time, she, uh, I finally got up the nerve to ask her about uh, the philandering. I, s I said it very, very judiciously, I thought. I said, how did you and how did you deal with some of the press reports about <laughs> your, your husband? And she said, yes, honey. Uh, you know, Lyndon loved people. <laughs> <laughs> and again, she meant it. She was a queen. She was the best person that I could have ever met in my life at that time. She replaced my mother. <laughs> and I told her that, and she said, oh, honey, that's the best comp compliment anyone's ever paid me. You know, Southern lady. You know, I, I get my wife and I were, were uh, lucky enough to get to know uh, Barbara Bush, Bar George H.W. and Barbara Bush. And um, one time she was uh, talking to me about Lady Bird Johnson. She said, you know, you know, Lady Bird was my favorite first lady. And then she thought about it and she said, oh, except Laura. <laughs> 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 Almost as an afterthought. <laughs> but she really admired Lady Bird Johnson, who understood the platform that she had as first lady and used it. And she encouraged her successors to do just that. Absolutely. Let's go to the Great Society if we can. Sure. Uh, he was determined to get through Congress. This is from you, uh, to get through Congress, the urgent issues society, uh, of society, which laid out very clearly, uh, which he laid out very clearly 12 hours after the assassination back at the Vice President's mansion where he uh, talked about uh, the four great enemies, poverty, education, bigotry, and ignorance, and he was determined to do something about them 12 hours after the assassination, before he had taken office. You know, he, ins he knew instinctively what to do, Larry. Um, and when, when John F. Kennedy is assassinated tragically in Dallas on November 22nd, 1963, you know that, that scene in Air Force One, the stiflingly hot cabin of Air Force One where he's being sworn in with Lady Bird Johnson on his right and the, the newly widowed Jacqueline Kennedy on his left in that that pink dress with the blood of her husband on it. And they go back to Washington, and LBJ goes to the Elms, his residence uh, in Washington before we had the vice president's residence. Uh, and, and he's up all night. And he's, he's laying out the great society. He knows exactly what he's going to do. And it's not just so much finishing the agenda of John F. Kennedy. It's finishing what Franklin Roosevelt had started in yeah. the New Deal. And central to that, central to finishing the, the vision that Franklin Roosevelt had was seeing civil rights for people of color in this country, which, which really Franklin Roosevelt never touched. No. Partly because he couldn't afford to alienate the very powerful southern uh, sen senators and, and, and representatives at a time when he was trying to push through New Deal legislation. That becomes a priority for Lyndon Johnson. And so he pushes through as his first major uh, initiative, the Civil Rights Act of 1963, which would become the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which of course broke the back of Jim Crow and its false promise of separate but equal law and facilities. Do you have any tape on this? We do. You know, I, I have two tapes. I mean, let me play. We talked about the two pillars of Johnson's legacy. The one is, you mentioned it earlier, it's Vietnam. You can't ignore that. Vietnam is a colossal mistake. It has to be put in context of the times and, and the, the domino theory that was prevalent among geopolitical thinkers. Um, so you, 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 have to t you, you have to look at, at Vietnam the way that others saw it at the time. We now know it was a major, monumental mistake. Uh, but that's, uh, uh, the first tape that I'll play is of LBJ talking to McGeorge Bundy. His national security advisor had worked in the same capacity for John F. Kennedy. And you can hear, and this is, this is in 1964, the summer of 1964, you can hear just the anguish and the profound ambivalence that LBJ has in escalating the war in Vietnam. So here is that, that tape. I think I'm doing this right, guys. Maybe not. Oh, here we go. I'm sorry. I'll tell you, the more I just stayed awake last night thinking about this thing, the more I think of it, I don't know what in the hell uh, 
We look like me, we're getting into another Korea. It just worries the hell out of me. I don't see what we can ever hope to get out of there with once we're committed. Once I believe the Chinese communists coming into it. I don't think that we can fight them 10,000 miles away from home and ever get anywhere on uh, in that area. I don't think it's worth fighting for, and I don't think we can get out. And it's just the biggest damn mess. It I is so. an awful mess. And we just got to think about to I look at this sergeant of mine this morning. Got six little old kids over there, and he's getting out my things and bringing me in my night reading and all that kind of stuff. And I just thought about ordering Ordered those kids in there. there. And what in the hell am I ordering him out there for? One thing that is Vietnam worth to me. What is Laos worth to me? What is it worth to this country? Now we have now to. Now we got, got a treaty, but still we got a treaty, but hell, uh, everybody else got a treaty out there, and they're not doing anything about it. Now, of course, if you start running the communists, they may just chase you right in your own kitchen. Yeah, that's the trouble. And that is what the rest of the, uh, that half of the world is going to think if this thing comes apart on us. That's, that's the dilemma. That's exactly the dilemma. I can't win, and I can't get out. Yeah. And it's just the biggest damn mess. Were he and Martin Luther King friends? Yeah, uh, uh, yes, and actually uh, they were. They were... Um, they were part. No, I don't want to say they were friends. They were partners. Um, let me play this next conversation, if I may. And this this is a conversation that uh, LBJ has with Martin Luther King. This happens on January fifteenth, nineteen sixty five, on what was Martin Luther King's thirty sixth birthday, and it's right before uh, the civil rights movement is about to stage this campaign in Selma, Alabama. And the, the goal is to get voting rights in this country. And this is LBJ talking to King about that campaign. And it shows this very harmonious partnership between the two where they know they need each other. And they're, each one is telling the other what they can do for each other in order to bring voting rights to fruition. Here's that conversation. You can't hear Martin Luther King very well. You can certainly hear LBJ very well. You can uh, contribute a great deal by getting your leaders and you yourself taking very simple examples of uh, discrimination where a man's got to memorize a long fella, whether he's got to quote the, uh, the first uh, uh, ten amendments or he's got to uh, tell you what to, Amendment 15, 16, 17 is, and then ask them if they know and show uh, what happens. And uh, uh, some some people don't have to do that. Or when a Negro comes in, he's got to do it. And if we can just repeat and repeat and repeat. And if you can find the worst condition that you run into in Alabama, Mississippi, uh, or Louisiana, or South Carolina, and if you just take that one illustration get it on radio and get it on television and get it on uh, in the pulpits, get it in the, in the meetings, get it every place you can. Uh, pretty soon, the, the fellow that didn't do anything but follow, drive a tractor, he'll say, well, that's not right, that's not fair. And then that will help us on what we're going to shove through in the end. And if we do that, we will break through as a uh, It'll be the greatest breakthrough of anything, not even except in this 64 Act. I think the greatest achievement of my administration, I think the greatest achievement in foreign policy, I said to a group yesterday, was the passage of the 1964 Civil Rights Act. But I think this will be bigger. What did you hear in that conversation? Yeah. It, it, what my favorite part of that is LBJ knows the American people. I think it's partly growing up in a small town. I really do. And he says that if you show the American people the injustices in the South when people are trying to exercise their right to vote, there, if, and if you repeat it and repeat it and repeat it, there isn't a fellow who doesn't do anything but drive a tractor who won't say, that isn't right, that isn't fair. LBJ grew up with some of the biggest bigots ever known to man. But he knows that Americans have this innate sense of justice this innate sense of decency. And if you show them that, they'll come around to it. And what you don't hear in this conversation is 
LBJ or, 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 or uh, Martin Luther King saying, you know, Mr. President, if you get more people of color to vote, you can expand your base among Democrats. They're, pu they're egging each other on. These are both canny politicians. Uh, Martin Luther King was as political as they get, really, really effective. And so they, they understand that they, they, they desperately need each other to make this happen. And it, that's pre precisely what they've mapped out in that, in that conversation is what comes to fruition. Again, you have Bloody Sunday playing out. People see that on television. There are 43 million people who are watching NBC that night because the film Judgment at Nuremberg is playing. Mm. And NBC News interrupts that movie in order to play that footage of Bloody Sunday. And the American people say, that isn't right. That isn't fair. And the Voting Rights Act gets passed. What about the story, remember when he was taking the trip up to Washington and his black driver talked to him about how it was? Do you, do you want to? I do. In 1957, uh, LBJ is about to pass the, the first Civil Rights Act, which was largely impotent, but for the fact that it's the first uh, civil rights legislation that's put on the books since Reconstruction. Almost 100 years have gone by, and there's no law relating to civil rights. It's largely impotent because LBJ realizes at that time it, it, he has to strip all the meaningful parts out of it or it won't pass at all. So it's better to pass something symbolically to show that progress is being made than nothing at all. Half a loaf is, you know, worth uh, more than nothing at all. And so that's, that's what he does. But when, as he's thinking about this, he talks to Gene, his driver, who every year would drive the family from Washington, the Elms, yeah. that residence I mentioned in Washington, back to the LBJ Ranch in, uh, outside Fredericksburg, Texas. And uh, LBJ says, uh, I understand, Gene, you don't want to take the dog. Little Johnson Beagle, LBJ. Little, his, his name was really Little Johnson Beagle. Little, little, little Beagle Johnson, excuse me. Uh, so LBJ, you're not taking the dog down there. He says, uh, Mr. President, do I have to take the dog? He says, well, Gene, the dog is a member of this family. Of course you have to take a dog. Why, now, now, why don't you want to take that dog down to Texas? He said, Mr. President, it's hard enough for an ego to drive through the South without a damn dog to take to. <laughs> and LBJ realizes, you know, I, I never thought of that. I can't imagine how much, how difficult that journey must be for you as a black man, let alone having to tend to somebody's dog. So, and, and he, he realizes his insensitivity at that point and uh, really pushes for the 1957 Civil Rights Act, the 1960 Civil Rights Act, and then that act that meant so much, uh, the, the 1964 Civil Rights Act. Let's talk about the Voting Rights Act and what the Supreme Court did to it. <laughs> well, you know, I, I, I think the... Uh, it was historical a personage yourself. Yeah, it's a monumental leap forward, and uh, I think we have to be very vigilant. Laws are, 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 uh, are, are not cemented. Laws can change. That's why Congress is on the Hill. Uh, we as a society change, and laws change. And I think if, uh, if we believe that all Americans should vote, uh, and I think that's a fundamentally, fundamentally American thing, we need to be vigilant about laws like the Voting Rights Act that uphold uh, that, that creed. I want to make, make one comment about Vietnam. Um, at, uh, at one point, uh, Jack Valenti in the book reports that uh, you, he, he brought all the, the people up to the Lincoln bedroom and he said, I want you to sit on the bed. And all these politicians and, and the people that worked for him said, I don't want to sit on that bed, Lyndon. And he said, no, sit on it. I'll tell you why, because I come in here every night, this was during the war, and I sit down on that bed and I think about Lincoln, and I think about the casualty list. And I, I sit there and I think sometimes all night long, I don't sleep. And I asked Lady Bird about that too. And she said, oh honey, I woke up many nights and I would hear moaning, moaning, and I would get up and put on my robe and I would go looking for Lyndon, but I'd open the door to the hallway and he was there with the casualty list, three in the morning, four in the morning, walking up and down just in pain, moaning over the new casualties of that day. Lyndon hated the war. He's a good Southern boy. He's a lover, not a fighter. And he hated the war. So it's just one more thing to add to your, your understanding of, the, of 
the war and what it did to him. Mm. The fact that, yes, he was a micromanager and he intended to micromanage everything in his life, correct? Mm, mm. And he micromanaged the war and it, it, hurt a it killed a lot of people. You know, I think the, 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 the interesting thing is, you're, uh, Larry's a dramatist, uh, there's not greater drama in the White House, or, or uh, I can't think of many instances in, in presidential history where there's more drama than there is in 1968 in the LBJ White House. In 1968, you have all these tragedies playing out. You have the assassinations of, of Martin Luther King uh, and Bobby Kennedy. You have the Tet Offensive, which changes the tide of the war in Vietnam. You have Prague Spring. You have the Democratic National Convention. Yeah. It, it is, it's, uh, but we have, you have the seizure of the USS Pueblo uh, by the North Koreans. 82 sailors, American sailors, were kept in captivity in North Korea for 11 harrowing months where they were beat and they were tortured. All this stuff is playing out in one single year. And during that year, LBJ is not only contending with these world events, these tumultuous world events, he also has his two daughters, Linda and, and Lucy, living under his roof, both of, one of whom is pregnant, the other uh, of whom has a, uh, his grandson, Lyndon, Lyndon Nugent, is about a year old at that point, while both of their husbands are serving in Vietnam. Just think about that. And this is the commander-in-chief putting them into harm's way, the, the, his sons-in-law, the, the fathers of his grandchildren. It's remarkable. So, of course, it weighed heavily on LBJ. And as you can hear from that conversation, I, I, which is most illustrative, of his ambivalence, he just doesn't know what to do about it, but he can't bring himself to pull out. Uh, we hear about this Nixon in intervention in the peace process. Do you want to comment on that? Well, that's another thing that's happening in 1968, which very few people know about. Um, there's the uh, LBJ decides on March 31st, 1968, not to run again. To the shock of the nation, he gives a speech where he says, uh, I will not see, I, I shall not seek, and I will not accept the nomination of my party for another term as your president. You can't imagine how earth-shaking that was in 1968. Here is this, this, this man, Lyndon Johnson, who has spent his whole ad adult life toward the, the acquisition uh, and implementation of power, and he's relinquishing the presidency. And he does so for two reasons. Number one, because of his heart. Uh, the, the Johnson boys, he used to say, died early. His father and his, his grandfather both died in their early 60s from heart, heart ailments. And as Larry knows, Lyndon Johnson nearly died himself of a fatal heart attack in 1955 at, at the age of 47. So he's very aware that he has a weak heart. He doesn't want to put the American people through the crisis of having their president either uh, sidelined with a heart attack or dead from a heart attack. So he opts not to run. The second reason... Uh, by the way, is that he wants to find an honorable peace in Vietnam, which has eluded him to that point. He wants to get Ho Chi Minh to the peace table. And sure enough, he makes that announcement, which is an overture to Ho Chi Minh, and Ho Chi Minh says he's willing to negotiate peace. Huge breakthrough. It, it's, there's a long time that elapses, and then we get into the fall. And Hubert Humphrey, LBJ's vice president, is squaring off for the presidency against the Republican nominee, Richard Nixon. What... LBJ found out probably too late uh, through bugging the, uh, the, the South Korean embassy is that Richard Nixon has sent an emissary, Anna Chenault, the wife of Claire Chenault, who is the hero of the Flying Tigers Regiment in Vietnam, to go to the South Vietnamese and urge them to hold off on the peace negotiations because they'll get a better deal from Richard Nixon. And the peace process goes off track. And LBJ doesn't quite know what to do about it. He doesn't want to put the American people through more turmoil in, in, an, in a year that has been absolutely momentous in terms of what has played out. And so he takes it to Hubert Humphrey. This is about a week right. before the election uh, uh, is held. And he says to Humphrey, I'm going to give this, you do what you want with this. And Hubert Humphrey, who is at that point rising in the polls, it's about neck and neck at that point, decides he doesn't want to do it. He wants to win the presidency honorably, not by taking this, this information forward. And Richard Nixon wins the presidency by one percentage point. Information that could be and has been called treasonous. Nixon's interference. Oh, we've got about um, 
four minutes for oh Medicare. Right, well, and fine. then we're going to get some questions. Good. Uh, unless you've got a thousand million questions. And how many people have questions? Just show of hands. Nobody. Okay. <laughs> Somebody's got a question. This is not a shy and retiring bunch. No, no, <laughs> no. All right. We're going to get, get to you. As, can we talk about Medicare first? All right. Medicare. Medicare. You know, uh, uh, I used to have in my office, I uh, wish I could show, show it to all of you, it, a shadow box containing the pens of the landmark legislation that Lyndon Johnson just signed in one year of his presidency, 1965. Uh, LBJ said that when a president is first elected, he's a giraffe. Six months later, he's a worm. <laughs> so while he was standing tall, he wanted to get as much through Congress as he possibly could. And so the, the laws that he signed uh, in 1965 include Medicare, Medicaid, the creation of Head Start, the creation of the National Endowment for the Humanities, and the National Endowment for the Arts, the creation of the, the Department of Housing and Urban Development, uh, highway beautification, clean air, voting rights, the Immigration Act, the most sweeping immigration reform we've ever had in the history of this nation, and that is one single year. Oh, I forgot two. The Elementary and Secondary Education Act, which is a profusion of federal aid to education for the first time, and the Higher Education Act, which allows uh, about 25% more people in the next year to go to college than had formerly matriculated. This is one single year. I can tell you I've had the great honor of knowing presidents, and there isn't one of them who wouldn't give his eye teeth for one or two pieces of the, those legislations throughout the entire, entirety of his presidency. It's an astounding legislative accomplishment. But Medicare is among them. And Medicare was something, it, it was uh, ostensibly, it's about health care. But really, it's a poverty act. Because at that point, over a third of those over 65 lived in poverty, not able to, to afford even the most basic medical expenses. So this was really... 50% 50, 50 you said had no medical insurance. 50% no of insurance people over 65 had no medical insurance then. So we were seeing, there, there was an expression at the time, he's, he's gone over to the poorhouse. Yeah. Well, there were these facilities where you just put an elderly person in, in that, to, to, to essentially to die. And so uh, that's what Medicare is about. It also desegregated hospitals. So it's, it's, it's also a civil rights uh, law in many respects. So he puts this, this together, and LBJ being LBJ realizes it's an opportunity to recognize the accomplishments of Harry Truman. So he goes down to the, the Truman Library, and who, uh, Truman, who tried to put through legislation that was like Medicare during his presidency, but, but failed. And LBJ signs Medicare at the Truman Library and gives the first pen to the man he called the real daddy of Medicare. So a really symbolic and, and uh, gracious gesture on the part of LBJ. How many people in this room did not know that Lyndon Johnson caused Medicare to happen? Yes, you see? We don't teach history very well, do we? No, we don't. All right, uh, let's have questions. Question time. Did you have a question? I think it's utterly ludicrous. Um, I've never, there, there, there's no compelling evidence that, that there was, in, in my view, I mean, I'm a, I'm a historian, but I haven't looked at every single bit. I, I was the director of the LBJ library for eight years and delved into the record. I, I, there, there's, let me just talk about conspiracy theories in general. There is nothing that seems to hold water or it would. And I can tell you that two people can't keep a secret. And a, a Especially in Texas. And right, exactly. <laughs> Uh, and a plot to murder the president would involve an awful lot of people, and there is nothing that's come forward that shows that there was any vast conspiracy around it. Let me ask you a question. Why do you think conspiracy theories like that hold on so long? People just want to believe? Well, it's, no, it's a good question, and it, it comes up in, again and again and again. I think I if you would uh, talk to LBJ at the time after taking presidency, he, he, he would say uh, he, would al he always wanted to be president, but that is not the way he wanted to be president, by seeing the assassination of a president he came to grudgingly admire. 
there was a partnership between the two of them that played out. Uh, you hear about the, the relationship between the Kennedys and Johnson. And, and it, that presumes that it was monolithic. There were different Kennedys and they had different relationships with Johnson. The, the, the relationship that LBJ had with JFK started off uh, warily. Uh, they, right. know, they knew they needed each other uh, for a variety of reasons, but I think uh, LBJ really came to admire the uh, uh, JFK's ability to inspire. And uh, JFK came to admire LBJ's ability to get things done. And, and ultimately, they are two complementary figures, right? Take NASA, for instance. Uh, JFK says what? We will go to the moon, right? Uh, he does so because uh, he sets LBJ out on f figuring out whether it's feasible, and LBJ tells him it is. But who gets it done? Who helps to build NASA in order to ensure that the space program is a success? That's LBJ. So they were really complementary, and I think they saw that in each other. Yes. Yes, sir. Man, it was as bad as you think it was. <laughs> <laughs> the relationship between uh, LBJ and RFK was not good. And as I talked to Harry McPherson, who was um, an aide to LBJ, and I said, what do you think about that? He said, well, put yourself in LBJ's shoes. You've got this, this young punk brother of this backbencher senator uh, who an is heaping... An upstart senator. An upstart senator, right, who is heaping contempt on you. And you, the, the all-powerful... Senate Majority Leader who is getting so much done, how would you feel? But Bobby Kennedy saw, you know, he was his brother's chief protector, and he didn't necessarily trust Lyndon Johnson, and I, I kind of understand his instincts too, right? His brother is trying to ascend to the presidency. You don't know exactly what LBJ's motivations are because he desperately wants power himself. So there was natural antipathy between the two of them, and I'm not sure it ever got resolved. The last time the two of them met, um, this is uh, a story. There was a gentleman named Larry Temple who's still alive in Austin, Texas, uh, who was an aide to LBJ, 31 years old, and he's in the cabinet room right after LBJ says he's not going to run again on April 3rd, 1968. This is the day before Martin Luther King is shot in Memphis, Memphis, Tennessee. And, um, and Bobby Kennedy goes in, and they're both sitting at opposite ends of the, the, the middle of the cabinet room table, which is pretty wide. So they're looking pretty far across at each other. And Bobby Kennedy says to LBJ, he says, uh, you made the right decision. You are, a, you are a wise and courageous man. And LBJ says, could you repeat that? Because <laughs> he knows how hard it is for Bobby Kennedy to spit out those words. <laughs> so afterward, he goes into the Oval Office and uh, he tells Larry Temple, that aide, get me that tape. Unbeknownst to Bobby Kennedy, he had taped the conversation. Larry Temple goes to get the tape, and he says, Mr. President, there was no transmission. And LBJ says, no, no, no. There's a, go get that tape. So he goes back, and he says, Mr. President, it seems like Bobby Kennedy had a scramble on. <laughs> so LBJ was so angry, not because he didn't have the tape, because he knew exactly what Bobby Kennedy saw, uh, had said, but because he had been outfoxed. <laughs> Question. Yes, sir. That, yeah, the, the question is, did LBJ, did LBJ, as a congressman, help, oh, to, save, sa right, have to, help to save Jewish refugees uh, in, in Europe during World War II? And the answer is emphatically yes, he did. Was he a, you know, an American Arthur Schind a Schindler? No, but he helped probably hundreds of refugees get to uh, America legally and did everything in his power to make it happen. There are some things you'll read on the internet where it was thousands upon thousands. It wasn't. But LBJ acted admirably. And I think, again, it showed his, his ability to empathize and understand the plight of those in need. Uh, it's a little-known chapter and, um, and, again, something that shows Lyndon Johnson's heart. This has been a great session. Thank you very much for being Sorry. here. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks so much. What a great...